First, I want to thank you for allowing me to share God's word with you this morning. I'm always humbled. And I, no matter how long we do this, I don't know if there's nothing wrong sharing this with you. You still get those butterflies. And I think that really comes from the knowledge that God entrusted us to share his word. And what a huge responsibility it is. And I want you to know that I, I take it seriously. And, and I hope I do God justice in the things that he has let me to say. But in that, let's please pray before we begin. Dear Lord, I come to you asking you forgiveness for my sins. I come to you repentant so that I might be open to hear your spirit, to share your word. Lord, may we all come with repentant hearts so that our hearts may be open to hear your spirit and to be guided by your word. So Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name. I recently read a story about a group of Sunday school kids, and the Sunday school teacher had asked the children to draw a picture of the Christmas story. And so most kids drew shepherds or angels, many of them drew the nativity scene, but one kid, he drew an airplane with four people in it. So the Sunday school teacher walked over and said, Tell me about your picture. And he said, well, it's the flight to Egypt with Joseph, Mary, and Jesus. And the teacher said, oh, but there's four people there. Who's the fourth person? And he said, well, that's Pontius, the pilot. <laughs> <laughs> Who is this guy, Pontius Pilate, anyway? There's a good chance that all of you have heard his name before, but we don't know a whole lot about Pontius Pilate. We know that he was a Roman governing ruler of the area of Judea between uh, 26 and 36 AD. We know that he was married, because it mentions his wife. But we probably know him most of all for the trial of Jesus. Judas became, uh, excuse me, Pilate became the final authority to Jesus' crucifixion. The interesting thing about Pilate is that he's mentioned in all four Gospels. And that makes him a very significant character. But here in John's Gospel, we have the most dialogue between Jesus and Pilate. This morning, however, our perspective is not on how much we know about Pilate. But I want to look today at how much Pilate knew about Jesus. Then in turn, I want us to ask ourselves, how much do we know about Jesus? Verse 33 says this, Therefore Pilate entered again into the praetorium, and summoned Jesus and said to him, You are the king of the Jews, or are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Are you saying this on your own initiative, or did others tell you about me? So he enters into the praetorium again. He had already gone out to address the Jews. Why are you sending this man to me? And interestingly enough, they don't say anything about him proclaiming to be the king. Or at least we don't have that in these accounts. But yeah, Pilate comes in with this question, and we got to assume that he knew it prior to the charge that was given to Jesus. But he comes in with this question, are you the king of the Jews? And just like Pilate being mentioned in all four Gospels, this question is also mentioned in all four Gospels. And whenever we see these repetitive mentionings in the Gospels, or throughout the scriptures, we know there's importance to it. Are you the king of the Jews? 
This is what Pilate is asking him. Who are you? Are you a king? And Jesus' response, are you saying this on your own initiative, or did others tell you about me? So Jesus is basically asking Pilate, is this what you believe in your heart, or is it because of what other people say? Are you truly saying this because you believe that I am king? When you sing these songs on Sunday morning, when you declare the words of who Jesus is, is that what you believe in your heart? If you're going to write anything in your notes this morning, I want you to write this question. Do you really believe all that you say about me? Do you really believe all that you say about me? If Jesus were to stand before you today, and hear these words that you sung and ask you this question, do you really believe all that you say about me? How would you respond? We sang the song, Jesus shall reign. This is the lyrics. To him shall endless prayer be made and endless praises crown his head. His name like sweet perfume shall rise with every morning sacrifice. Do you really believe that? Is that something you truly believe and is reflected in your heart? While the offertory was going on, I wrote down the words that were up on the screen. Jesus, Jesus, Lord to me, Master, Savior, Prince of Peace, Ruler of my heart today. Jesus, Lord, to me. Do you really believe that? Do you truly believe that Jesus is your master, your savior, the prince of peace? How does your life reflect that? If you're saying to yourself, man, I, I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm not sure that my life really reflects that. Find comfort in this. You're not alone. Remember, right before this, John tells us that Peter denies Jesus three times. When the going got tough, Peter buckled. The same guy that said, Jesus, I will lay down my life for you. He hid his relationship with Jesus three consecutive times. The same guy that cut off somebody's ear to fight for Jesus, ready to battle, buckled, failed in a time where he was to proclaim what he truly believed about Jesus. When the prophecy was fulfilled, and Peter recognized this. The book of Mark says that Peter wept. So on that same note, Peter recognized his moment of weakness, and he went on to become one of the most faithful disciples of Jesus. So while you can find comfort that you're not alone if you feel this way, know also that Peter did not stop there. He did not rest there. He did not become comfortable in his moment of weakness. But he went on and he became one of Jesus' most faithful apostles, providing us so much of what we have in our life. You call yourselves Christians. You build a convincing exterior image of a Christian. You pay your tithes. You volunteer at charitable events. You even come out to ministry activities. You come to church every Sunday. You might even go to Sunday school every Sunday. This is not proof that you know Jesus. These things do not prove what you know about Jesus. How well do you know Jesus as King of Kings and Lord of Lords? How well do you really know 
Jesus as your personal Savior. Recently, we had some friends over. Emily shared her testimony. If any of you have ever heard Emily's testimony, there was a moment when Emily was at California Baptist University. She was in this moment of desperation and she called out to God. God changed her life. In her own words, God gave me new eyes. She woke up the next morning and she said, things were different. I saw things differently. But the most amazing part about this is Emily grew up in the church. She was born into a Christian family. She was a part of all of these children's activities, Awanas and, and all these other wonderful activities that we have. She memorized scripture verses. She won the awards. She got the gold stars. She knew how to act and talk like a Christian. But in this moment in college, in her testimony, she says, not until this point did I realize I never really knew God. I never really knew God. You may have been going to church all, all your life. You may have memorized the entire Bible. You may do and say all the right things. The most important question is, do you really know Jesus? If you do not really know Jesus, then a day may come where he says, I don't really know who. Look at what it says here. Luke 13, 22 to 27. And he was passing through from one city and village to another, teaching and proceeding on his way to Jerusalem. When someone said to him, Lord, are there just a few who are being saved? And he said to them, Strive to enter through the narrow door, for many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Once the head of the house gets up and shuts the door and begins to stand outside it, and you begin to stand outside and knock on the door saying, Lord, open up to us, then he will answer and say to you, I do not know where you are from. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank with you in your presence, and you taught in our streets. And he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you are from. Depart from me, evil doers. So what is this narrow gate? I believe it is truly knowing Jesus, truly having a relationship with Jesus, Listen to this in Matthew 7, 21 to 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father, who is in heaven, will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform miracles. And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. I don't know. This, this concerns me. This really concerns me. Does this concern you? Does this concern you? Hearing this. The door is narrow, Jesus says. Verse 35, Pilate answers Jesus. I'm not a Jew, am I? Your own nation, your own chief priest delivered you to me. What have you done? What have you done? Now I want to swing our perspective a different way of knowing Jesus. Here, Pilate gives an, uh, an excuse. Well, I'm not a Jew. I'm not a part of you. So even if you are the king of the Jews, why does that affect me? It has nothing to do with me. Why would I even care? Consider this for a moment. The people in our lives that do not know Jesus, should Jesus stand before them? How would they respond according to our witness? According to the way that we live and the way that we sing that we know Jesus. How would people respond 
to Jesus should they stand before them. Have we reflected the true knowledge and commitment to Jesus as king in our lives? To Pilate, he saw Jesus' own people hand him over to be crucified, to be killed, to be turned in. The people that he proclaimed kingship over sent Jesus to his death. Can other people tell that Jesus is your king? Do other people see that in your life? When you go to work or in your neighborhoods, do people look at you and the way you live and say, man, Jesus is a big part of their life. It's the most important thing. Jesus is their king. Or, or, or would they say, well, Lord, you know, Jason, he says he's a Christian, but he comes to work every day, and he gossips, and he lies, and he steals pens from the office. <laughs> well, you know, Lord, Jesus said, I mean, Jason said that you're, you're the king, and that you're his Lord, but you know what, his life doesn't look any different than mine. His life doesn't look any different than mine. If money, professional success, family, and other things of this world seem to rule over our lives, we are no different than other people. Jesus is our King. One thing that I believe stunts our growth as Christians is that we have developed this soft, cuddly, teddy bear image of Jesus. Jesus is my buddy. Jesus is my friend. So warm and loving. Jesus becomes this household pet that we come home to after work. Jesus is King. Jesus is Lord of Lords. As a Christian, this is what we are proclaiming. Jesus is our King. Do we really live a life under the kingship of Jesus? I have a friend that took her family to church. They've never been to church, but they had a young family and they thought, well, now that we have a family, we should probably take our family to church. It would be good for them. They went for a couple of months and then they stopped. And so I asked her, why didn't you stop going to church? She said, well, you know, there's so much drama and conflict that I don't have in my own personal life. So we decided it was probably best not to go to church. Jesus is your King, Lord of Lord, Savior, risen Son of God. Being a Christian means that you proclaim that in your life. Does your life reflect that? Does this church reflect that? Look at our own church here. There's gossip here. There's unhealthy conflict amongst individuals in our church. Jesus says in John 13 that all men will know that you are my disciples by your love. Those under the kingship of Jesus will have love amongst each other. Will have love amongst each other. Do we have that? in our own lives and in our church. Then consider this, the high priests are Jews. Jesus is the Messiah who came through the Jewish people and yet they refused to know him because he didn't fit in their agendas. Because the chief priests wanted authority, they wanted power, they wanted to rule and Jesus was ruining all of that. Even though he was proclaiming, I am the Messiah that you are looking for. I am the king that you are looking for. He refused to know Jesus more. They refused to know Jesus more. And how easy for us is it for us to do that? To intentionally reject knowing Jesus on a deeper level because it just doesn't fit in our agenda. Because it cramps our style, because it doesn't fit in our schedule. I've used this line before. Oh yeah, you know, I have my prayer time with God in the car because, you know, traffic is so bad. So I turn off my radio and I have just great prayer time with God 
You know, it's so fantastic. That's good. That's good. But is that the only prayer time you're going to have because Jesus fits into your schedule? Because, hey, I have nothing else to do. I'm trapped in this car in traffic for half an hour, so I might as well pray. What about the other times of your life? What about every other time in your life? If we submit to the kingship and authority of Jesus, we'll abandon everything, everything, to know him more. On Wednesday nights, Pastor Tim leads a Bible study featuring a video by David Platt. This past Wednesday, David Platt recites Luke 14, 25, and 26. Now, large crowds were going along with him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother, and wife and children, and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now, David Platt goes on to explain this idea of hate, and the way that he explains it is that you love God so much that your love for God is so superior that your love for anyone else appears as hate. That's David Platt's explanation. I see it simply as this. Do you love God above everyone and everything else? That's the way I read that scripture. Do you love God above everyone and everything else in your life? I want you to imagine this for a second. The person that you know most in your life. Who is that? Is it your spouse, your child, your sibling, your parent, your best friend? Think about that person. Think about how intimately you know that person. Do you know Jesus that way? Do you know Jesus that way? Do you know Jesus better than anyone in your life? How can that be? That's impossible. He's not in front of me. My wife is there every day, so of course I can know her better. She's there. So how am I supposed to know Jesus better than that? Because we come to know Jesus and build that relationship with him in a spiritual way. In a spiritual way. We come to know Jesus in the Spirit and build this relationship with Him in the Spirit. Verse 36 says this, Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom, if, if my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. And here we understand the kingdom and the kingship in spiritual matters. When we read this word kingdom here in the Bible, we can cast out any thoughts of any kind of physical place. When Jesus is talking about his kingdom, it's his rule, it's his kingship over us in the spiritual realm. That is what Jesus is referring to by his kingdom. And we can only come to get to know him more when we live in the spirit and less in the flesh. Again, we go back to Emily's testimony. You can memorize all the scriptures you want. You can act and talk like a Christian all you want on the outside. But how does the Spirit connect with God? How do you know God in the Spirit? He is the king of our spiritual selves. Letting our hearts meditate on things that are not pleasing to God does not reflect a life that is ruled by the kingship and authority of Jesus Christ. Lust, greed, selfishness, pride, all of these things can easily rule over our spiritual lives. How deep is your spiritual relationship with Jesus? <clears throat> Dr. Gerald Borscher of Carson Newman College says, it's clearly possible to be academically right and theologically correct, but still lack integrity in life. How well do you know Jesus? How does your relationship with Jesus serve as a witness? And how do we know if we know Jesus? How do we know if we know Jesus? This is what verse 37 says. Therefore Pilate said to him, So you are king? Jesus answered and said, 
You say correctly that I am king. For I have been born, for this I have been born, and for this I have come into the world to testify about the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Jesus came for this purpose, to be king. Jesus, the word of God made flesh, the word of God that was from the beginning of time, came to us in this world. And he died an atoning sacrifice for us. To be raised again, to defeat the death of sin that was meant for us. To be with the Father in glory. To rule the kingdom of heaven. This is why Jesus came. This was his purpose. And when we know him, and when we know that, we hear his voice. So I ask you, when was the last time you heard God's voice? When was the last time you heard Jesus speak to you? When was the last time he directed your life? What was the last word that you heard from Jesus? To Pilate, Jesus was just another man. When I first learned about Pilate, I kind of felt bad for the guy. It seemed like he was trying his best to let Jesus go. He was trying to free Jesus, and I thought, wow, that's not fair, he was really trying. But he wasn't trying to know Jesus. He did not try to know Jesus as Lord of Lord and of King of Kings. In the end, Pilate was still lost without Jesus. Verse 38 tells us that Pilate, Pilate's response was, what is true? What is true? And he went on his way. Even for us, we go to church, we express our affection for Jesus, we sing these wonderful songs, but if we never really get to know Him, He may never really know us. And I want to end with this. Do not be deceived by some misconception that you're a new Christian or you're a young Christian and knowing Jesus is something you work toward. Having a deep relationship with Jesus is something you can and should have today and every day of your life. We can hear from God if we intentionally listen for His voice. We seek Jesus in the scriptures and through prayer every day of our lives. In this, we seek and find our spiritual relationship with Jesus. Seek to know Him. And on the day when you stand before Him, and he says, do you really believe all that you say about me? Am I truly your king? You can be confident in your relationship with Jesus and say, yes, Lord, you are my king. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we desire to know you more. Lord, we thank you for your scriptures. We thank you that you give us a means to know you. Father, I pray that you will help us to set aside the things of the world that distract us from getting to know you more. Lord, I pray that you will lead us into that spiritual relationship with you that we may know you, that we may live our lives under your kingship. Lord, and that other people around us will see that we are different because we live under your authority and your kingship. Because you are Lord of our lives and we place you first and foremost above anyone and anything else in our lives. 
Lord, be with us this week as we come to know you. In Jesus' name. Maybe today you want to know Jesus.